Good afternoon. Good morning. <laughs> the change of time just throws everything out the, through the window. Uh, good morning. So this land, uh, we have been kind of walking together through the season with these two questions taken from the book uh, Rebuild Faith. And the question number one is, who is Jesus in my life? And the question number two is the effort to follow Jesus, to follow God worth it? And why is it worth it? It's a good question. Um, and it's an important question. I mean, we ask these kind of questions basically of everything in life, don't we? Is it worth my time, my energy? Is it worth it? Now, last week, the Samaritan woman responded to these questions with a resounding yes, as did other people in her village. And they all became the followers of Jesus. Now, today we, we read from chapter 9 in the Gospel of John, in which we meet a man that was born blind, never able to see. Now, the blind man also had to answer the question, who is Jesus? as he himself was questioned by the Pharisees. John tells us, so they said, the Pharisees, to the blind man again, what do you have to say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. So the blind man first describes Jesus as a prophet who has an amazing power to heal. And then later on, as the story unfolds, we learn more. So we read again, so a second time they, the Pharisees, called the man who had been blind and said to him, give God praise. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. He replied, if he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that I was blind, and now I see. The blind man simply cannot deny what happened to him. He knows what happened. And he is going to stick to the story, no matter what. One thing I do know is that I was blind. And now I see. So to him, Jesus initially was a healer and a prophet. But that's not the end of the story. By the end of the story, he recognizes that there is even more to this person whose name is Jesus. 
who just healed him. John tells us, when Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, the one speaking with you is he. And he said, I do believe, Lord. And he worshipped him. So now Jesus is the Messiah and the Lord. And John tells us that the blind man worshipped him. So he recognizes that Jesus is God made flesh. Only God can be worshipped. No one else in the Jewish tradition. That's the first commandment. You know? So as, again, as the story unfolds, his understanding of Jesus grows and deepens. It's not instant. It kind of comes in stages. The more time he spends with Jesus, the more he gets to know him. And that is true of all the followers in the Gospel of John. And it's true of each and every one of us. But there is even more to it. Now the statement, he worshipped him, caught my attention. Because during the ministry of Jesus, before the resurrection, Jesus was not really worshipped. It is only after the resurrection that his followers worship Jesus. You know? So in a way, what we learn here is that the blind man becomes a part of the community of the followers of Jesus. He worships him. See, the early followers of Jesus worshipped Jesus not as individuals, but always as a community. When they gathered together and they did what we are doing right now, when they gathered, they broke the bread, they shared the cup, and they worshiped Jesus. So after the blind man is thrown out of the synagogue, he joins another synagogue, that of Jesus and his followers. And Jesus does not throw any one out. Jesus welcomes everyone. Everyone belongs. The Gentiles, the Jews, the Samaritans, lepers, men and women. Everybody belongs to the community. John wrote the gospel, the fourth gospel, again, not to individual, but to a community some 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus. So did Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Paul, as he preached the gospel to the Gentiles, established communities all over the place. And then he wrote letters to them. And you know them, those letters, to the Corinthians to Thessalonians, to Galatians. 
to Philippians, to the Romans. And he always starts with brothers and sisters. Again, it's a community. So what's the point? I think the main point is this, and it's a powerful reminder, that we are not called to be followers of Jesus alone. We are not called to be people of faith alone. To grow as followers of Christ, we need others. We need a community. We need one another. And others need us. You know, that is how we grow. Now, have you ever seen a Canada goose fly alone? I have not. Have you? I haven't because they do not. They are smart. They know that flying alone is much more difficult. You know? When they fly south for the winter, they do it together. And they make a lot of noise. And they do other things as well. And they do fly in one specific way. They fly in a V formation. Geese flying together, did you know this? Fly 70% longer distance than if a goose were to fly alone. They know they need to fly in a group formation to get to their destination faster. And it is called a skein, S-K-E-I-N. They need, they need each other's help to thrive, and to survive. And I love this image because I think this is true of all the followers of Christ, of all the people of faith. We all need each other along the journey. As followers of Christ, we are called to fly in a skein, in the V formation, together. That is why we gather and we pray for one another. We may not even know what each and every person is going through right now in this church, but still we are here and we are praying for one another. You know? That is why we started AV ministry in our parish so long ago to stay connected with those people who cannot join us in person. So we can wave to them right now as they are watching. You know? And why? Because, again, as followers of Christ, we are not called to do it alone. We are not called to do life alone and faith alone. We all need one another. We all need a community as followers of Christ.